This is the review of the HSPT problem 4. The problem specifies that you need to determine if there are any adjacent duplicate characters in the string. In the first sample, you can see that there are no identical characters next to each other, so you'll output good night. One thing to note for this case and all other cases is that you need to take in the whole string, the whole line, as opposed to just a single word or token. This second sample case is the first one with an adjacent pair of duplicate characters. As you can see, these double R's are the same and are next to each other, so the output no sleep here is appropriate for this case. This third sample case also demonstrates that even if there are multiple, more than two pairs, more than two characters that are the same next to each other, as long as there are two or more, you should still output no sleep here. One thing we generally recommend is that in these cases where you need to output something very specific, you should copy the sample outputs into your program as opposed to manually typing them in. And in general, your program will check each pair in the string one at a time. So it'll check the zero and one index character, then the one and the two, then the two and the three, until it either reaches the end of the string like in sample case one, where it should then return the appropriate value or output good night, depending on your implementation. Or like in sample case two, it will hit the adjacent characters that are the same, and then it should output no sleep here or return the appropriate value. Hello, my name is Natalie Longton, and I am a judge for the UCF High School Programming Tournament. I really hope you all enjoyed the contest today. I hope you're able to write some good code, solve some good problems, and have fun. Yeah. So today, I will be going over the problems that I wrote for this contest. They are in approximate order of difficulty. You Come and Go, A Spy on the Inside, Jailhouse Rock, and Princess Plum Chiffon. So, yeah, without further ado, You Come and Go. So, for this problem, you are given an array of integers, and you are expected to find the number of streaks of equal numbers that occur in this array. So, a couple of sample inputs. For this first sample, you're going to have a bunch of streaks of length one, right? So you're going to have this one is its own individual thing. Then you have this one, this three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They're all in their own individual streaks. So that's why the answer is going to be eight here. However, for this sample input number two, we notice right off the bat that we have a streak of length three at the beginning, and that's going to be a streak of ones. We follow that up by a streak of twos, followed by a streak of threes, followed by another streak of ones. So that's going to be a total of four streaks. So that's where the sample output number two comes from. That's why it's four. So the thing to consider here, how do we know when a new streak begins? And how do we know when we remain in the same streak? So if I were to give you this problem, and ask you to solve it with some pen and paper, what would you do? I think that is something that's important to think about when you're trying to solve this problem. And it gives way to a nice linear solution. A new streak begins at index 0, so at the beginning of the array, and a new streak is going to begin at every index i where the value at i is different from the value at index i minus 1. In other words, we're going to start a counter at 1, then iterate through each element in the array. We increment our answer every time we encounter an element that is not equal to the element that comes directly before it. And that's all we need to do. So I hope that made sense to you all. Now moving on to the next problem, a spy on the inside. So in this problem, I'm going to pull up some samples actually. In this problem, you're given a map 
it's a floor plan like this. So the dots are floor cells. These hashtags here are wall cells. And then these capital P's are denoting people, okay? And people can be either spies or guards. You don't know which one, though. What you do know is that spies must be adjacent to at least one wall, and guards must be adjacent to no more than one wall. We are expected to find the minimum and maximum number of spies there can be. Okay, so, so the thing to ask yourself, right, What's already coming to your mind is why can't we figure out the number of spies exactly? Where is the ambiguity here? And looking at this sample can help us determine that. So if we take a look at this guy in the middle and check his four cardinal directions, up, down, left, and right, we can see that he's not adjacent to any walls. Okay. And in the problem, it states that spies must be adjacent to at least one wall. So this guy in the middle here cannot be a spy. Similarly, let's take a look at this guy up in the top left. We can see that he's adjacent to two walls, one in the up direction and one in the left direction. But it states that guards must be adjacent to no more than one wall. So this guy in the top left cannot be a guard, which means he has to be a spy. And finally, this guy on the right is a little bit interesting. Why is that? So if we look at how many walls he's adjacent to, we can see that it's one to the right. And we know that spies must be adjacent to at least one wall. And guards must be adjacent to no more than one wall. So we don't know for certain whether this one on the right here is a spy or a guard, and that's really the crux of the solution. A person adjacent to zero walls must be a guard. A person adjacent to more than one wall must be a spy. But if a person is adjacent to exactly one wall, that's when we don't know whether they are a spy or a guard. So the solution is to iterate through every single person in the grid and obtain the number of walls that they are adjacent to. After we do that, let x be the number of people adjacent to exactly one wall. Let s be the number of people adjacent to more than one wall. So we know with absolute certainty that the people adjacent to more than one wall are spies. Therefore, the minimum number of spies sent into the compound is s. The number of people adjacent to one wall. So these people could be spies or they could be guards, and we don't know. But if we're trying to find the maximum number of spies that were sent to the compound, we're going to assume that these people were all spies. And therefore, this maximum number will be equal, equal to s plus x. Um, yeah, I hope that made sense to you all. Now, moving on to the next problem, jailhouse rock. So, in this problem, we are given a string s and an integer x. We are asked to generate a string t that contains s as a substring exactly x times. I also put the bounds up here because, as it turns out, the bounds are pretty important for solving this particular problem. One thing to consider, or one thing you might think of, is let us simply take x copies of the string s and concatenate them back to back to back, and that will be our string t. And you're right, you know, this is a good thought. It's, it's the start of something, and it works. I would actually say this works most of the time, but it doesn't work all the time. We can't concatenate multiple copies of string s because extra instances of s might crop up in the kind of in-between areas. So consider the sample input one. So we have three a's, and we need this to appear exactly twice in our string. So you'll notice that the sample output is 
is four A's. So you might be asking, why is it only four? Well, it's because there are two occurrences of the substring AAA. They just overlap each other, right? So the first occurrence is starting at the beginning of the string here. And then the second occurrence is starting at index one here. So they do overlap, but there are exactly two occurrences of the string S. Note that if we were to try concatenating the string S to itself, we would get six A's, which is actually too many copies of the string S. It's actually four copies that overlap each other. So we've run into a problem here. We've run into a problem here. So, so please consider, how can you ensure that no instances of the string S overlap? Because this is our, this is our issue, right? We are going to get too many occurrences of the string S if they overlap each other when we're trying to put them down. So that's your hint number one. And another hint, check the bounds. What do they suggest? So feel free to, to pause the video, by the way, at any point if you are trying to think of a solution. But I'm going to move on here. The critical observation is that we can use a delimiting character to separate occurrences of the string S. So, for example, rather than just concatenating two copies of AAA to each other, we can separate each copy with another character, like something like AAABAAA. And this is perfect because now our two copies of the AAA string are separate, and we have exactly two of them, which is what we want. And note that you don't have to use B. You can use C or D. In fact, you can use any letter except A, okay? <laughs> so now th this is good, right? We know that we can use this delimiting character to separate and prevent any overlap between our occurrences of string S. But you might be thinking, well, not every character works as a delimiting character, right? Like, for example, in this sample, A doesn't work as a delimiting character. How do we know whether a character will work? How do we know whether there even exists a character that will work? And my argument to you is that there will always be at least one. In fact, there will always be several. This is because if we check the bounds again, there are at most 20 characters in the string S. By the pigeonhole principle, there will be at least six alphabetic characters that do not exist in S at all. Because if you picture the worst case, it would be 20 distinct letters. But there are 26 total letters in the alphabet, which means that there were still six unused. If a character is never used in string S, I argue that it makes a perfect candidate for a delimiting character because if you use a string if you use a character that never appears in S, then there cannot be any copies of string S kind of spanning the in-between area in between copies of string S, right? That's because they would have to span over the delimiting character, but the delimiting character doesn't appear in S at all. So yeah, the intended solution is to find a character that does not exist in S and use this as your delimiting character. Now, I realize that this problem probably has many other solutions, but this was how I thought about it. So I, I hope you enjoyed that one. I will now move on to the last problem, Princess Plum Chiffon. So in Princess Plum Chiffon, we are given a graph structure of kingdoms and roads that we may traverse to go from kingdom to kingdom. We are also given the special power 
in the problem, it is a lucky star that we may use exactly once, or should I say no more than once. And this star enables us to teleport from kingdom I to kingdom N minus I plus one. We wish to know the time it will take to travel from kingdom zero to every other kingdom in the land. So each of these journeys is to be evaluated independently. So we want to know like the distance from kingdom zero to kingdom one. And then we want to know the distance from kingdom zero to kingdom two, kingdom zero to kingdom three, so on and so forth. And for every journey, we have this ability to teleport in a very specific way. So we wish to find distances from a single source. So Dijkstra's is a single source shortest path algorithm, and it would really be perfect for this problem. The tricky part is knowing how to construct the graph. In particular, how can we handle the teleportations? So a hint, there are two parameters to consider what kingdom you're in, and whether you've used the teleportation ability. Okay, these are the two things you need to consider. So how can we construct a graph to account for both things? How can we ensure that the star, the teleportation ability, will be used at most once? Feel free to pause the video and think about this a little bit because the solution to this one, I think, is particularly interesting. What we can do is construct a weighted bidirectional graph with two identical layers. And each layer is going to represent the kingdoms in the land and the roads between them. So this is sample input one. So this top layer here is the kingdom, and then this bottom layer here is also the kingdom. So, so they are going to be identical layers to each other. The key is these directed edges connecting the first layer to the second layer. So each of these directed edges connecting layer one to layer two represents a teleportation or a use of the star, okay? And the key, okay, the key is that there is only one opportunity to traverse this kind of edge, okay? And that's because if you're in the first layer of the graph, it represents a state that you're in that you have not used your ability yet, okay? But if you're in layer two, you must have traversed one of these directed edges to get there, which means that you must have teleported. Okay, so this is how you are going to set up the graph. Once you do, all you need to do is run Dijkstra's starting at kingdom one, where you have not yet used your ability. So that's going to be kingdom one in the first layer run Dijkstra's on this graph, and you're going to get a bunch of distances. So once you get all the distances, your answer for each kingdom, the, the time it will take to get from kingdom one to kingdom I is going to be equal to the minimum between the distance from node one to node I in layer one, and the distance from node one to node i in layer two, because this represents the two cases of getting to kingdom i without using the lucky star, which might be faster, or getting to kingdom i while using the star. So I hope that made sense. The, the key to this problem is really how to construct the graph then running Dijkstra's after should be pretty straightforward. But yeah, um, it was a pleasure to organize this contest for all of you. I hope you all enjoyed the contest and learned something new. 
So thank you for listening. Hello everybody, welcome to the editorial for Cut the Cake, brought to you by your host Steve from Minecraft. But this problem is not about me, it is about one of our good friends Tyler from the judging committee. In this problem, Tyler starts off with a magnificent cake of size less, and he cuts his cake into two pieces of equal size and each resulting piece into two pieces of equal size, up until all the pieces are of size 1. The key thing for this problem is that the cuts follow integer division, so if there is a piece of size 5, it uses one cut to turn into two pieces of cut of size 2. So let's move on and see how can we approach this. So the first idea you might have for this problem is to do some kind of recursive solution, where for a piece of size S, the number of cuts it takes to reduce it to a bunch of pieces of size 1 would be 1 plus however many cuts it takes for a piece of size 2, of size S over 2, and another piece of size S over 2, because those are like the resulting pieces that we create from one cut on this cake. So that recursive approach uh, follows this relation. And the bad thing about it though is that it will be too slow. Uh, it would run in order S time because at each step you are kind of like branching off in two different directions. Uh, now because each of those directions has solved the problem for a piece of size S over 2, then, you know, like the typical 2 to the n that would happen from branching out is sort of cancelled out by the fact that you're dividing by 2 each time. Um, but that ends up being order s. And because s can go up to 10 to the 9, then that is actually too slow and you might get hit with a TLE. You probably will. Time limit exceeded. In which case, you might go like, huh. Um, and <laughs> try to come up with an optimization. <laughs> So, moving on to how we might be able to optimize this. Since we know that the pieces that we create will always be of equal size, then instead of doing the recursive relation that traverses both the uh, directions in the recursive tree, we can actually only traverse one of the directions and multiply the answer that we get from that by 2. So instead of having like here in our recurs in our recurrence relation used to be one plus an answer of s over two plus answer of s over two, we can just recurse on one side of that tree and multiply that answer by two. And this would actually work and it would run in time because the runtime of this would be order log of s uh, base two. So you could implement it using recursion or you can simplify it to a for loop where you keep dividing the size of your current piece by two and then to account for like the splits that happen you know that there would have been two to the i pieces of size s uh, where i is the index is the step in your iteration loop um, so you can also add i uh, two to the i to your answer at each step and stop whenever the whenever the size of your cake is equal to 1 and that will get you the same result. So we can run through the idea on one of the samples where we begin with a size of 10. At the beginning we just have one piece so one cut that we're going to make we add that to our answer plus 1 so that's going to be 2 to the 0. Uh, then we will have two pieces um, coming from that cut and each of these pieces we're going to need to cut because they're still not size 1 so we add 2 to the answer which would be 2 to the 1 then following that we have 4 pieces that still need to be cut so 2 to the 2 is equal to 4 we add that to our answer as well and finally we have 8 pieces that are all the same and since they're all equal to 1 then we don't need to cut anymore and we just return our answer. So 1 plus 2 plus 4 is equal to 7. So 2 to the 0 plus 2 to the 1 plus 2 to the 2 is equal to 7. Hello everyone, my name is Tyler Marks and I'm one of the judges for the 2023 UCF High School Programming Tournament. In this video, I'll be reviewing solutions to three of the problems from the contest. 
two of the problems I wrote, which are hexes and spells, and I4 eyesore. And the last problem will be stronghold triangulation, which was written by Brennan. Let's begin with hexes and spells. In this problem, we're given a set of strings which represent our hexes, and we're given a singular uh, string that represents our spell. The goal of this problem is to figure out if there is any way to arrange the hexes such that our spell occurs as a substring. So, for the current arrangement of hexes, we have the overall string BABA, ABCA, uh, CABA. And we can see that in this string, BACA does not occur anywhere as a substring, therefore, uh, this arrangement is invalid. However, if we were to arrange our hexes as ABCA, BABA, CABA, we now have BACA as a substring here. Therefore, this arrangement is valid, and there is, in fact, a way to create our spell. So one idea for this might be to try every permutation of hexes and check to see if the spell occurs. However, this would be really slow. So uh, one major uh, bound on this problem is that every single hex and spell will be of the exact same length. So what this allows us to do is make a vital observation. And that observation is that our spell will only be contained within two adjacent hexes. So instead of brute forcing every single permutation of hexes, we can instead brute force every pair of hexes. And then what we're going to do is, so like now we can say, take BABA and ABCA and try seeing if we can combine those two and check to see if BACA now occurs as a substring. However, in this case, we do not. So let's try another pair. We can now try the pair BABA and CABA. So in this pair, we can uh, concatenate BABA and CABA. And look, now we have our spell. So we'll try every single pair of hexes and check to see if our spell occurs. How might we check to see if the spell is a substring of our uh, pair of, uh, or our concatenation of our pairs? So we couldn't uh, hand code this. However, what's nice is all three languages have a built-in uh, substring find. In Python, to see if a string is a substring of another, we can use the keyword in. Uh, in Java and C++, we can use the dot find function for this. So uh, we can. So that's a, an easy way for us to look for substrings within a bigger string. So now, um, the last thing we need to discuss is that there is a few, a few edge cases with this problem. In this problem, one of the main issues is when we're brute forcing every pair. Uh, so let's say we, we brute force every hex of i and every hex of j. We never want i to equal j. However, this leads to an edge case of what if our hex, what if we have a singular hex ABAB -A and a singular spell ABAB? -A well, since our hex is equal to our spell, that means it is therefore possible to make it. So what we have to do is we have to check to see if our spell ever occurs as a hex or ever occurs in our set of hexes. Next, let's discuss I4 eyesore. 
In this problem, we are given that there is a square room composed of walls made out of mirrors. And we're given that there is a guy who is trapped in the middle of the room who is facing towards the left. And then we're also given that there is another point in this room that contains a code. And we want to figure out what is the minimum angle this guy needs to rotate such that he can see the point within k reflections. So let's say k is equal to 1. If he rotates to this angle, he could then see the point by reflecting off the bottom wall, then looking at the point. Similarly, he could look towards uh, the left wall, have a reflection off the left wall that then goes to the point. Or we could use no reflections and look directly to the point itself. Uh, there's more options than just these three. However, out of these three, we can see that the blue is the best option. So now, let's take a look closer look at reflections. Let's say we have a mirror, a vertical mirror. And let's say we have these two points where something leaves the first point, reflects off the mirror, and then sees the second point. Based off of the definition of a reflection, we know that these two angles will always be equal to each other. So what we can do instead of looking at it as a reflection is we can reflect this point across the mirror and then directly connect our first point to our second point. So going back to the sample here, What we can now do is we will reflect the point about each of the mirrors. So when we reflect across the bottom mirror, we'll get this point. When we reflect across the left mirror, we'll get a point over here. The top mirror will give us a point up here. And then the right mirror will give us a point over here. Drawing the rooms around these points, we get something that looks like this. Now, if we wanted to now say do two reflections, we can repeat this step for each of our new points. So we would get a point that's up here, point that's over here, then we can continue this for each of our points. So one idea for, to solve this problem is we can brute force each of these points up to k times, get all of the lines directly to uh, those points, and then now when we view our original guy and some new point, what we can do is we can form a right triangle out of this. And we want to figure out what this angle here is going to be. So to figure out this angle, we know that the top leg here is going to have a length of delta x, and the left leg here is going to have a length of delta y. So to solve for theta, we can use the tangent function. Tangent of theta here is going to be equal to delta y over delta x. Let's take a closer look at the tangent function. If we were to take a look at the tangent function graphically, we would see that it looks something along the lines of this. So what we know about the tangent function is that as theta increases, the tangent of theta is also going to increase. So what this means is that as delta y increases, well, this whole fraction is going to increase, uh, this fraction right here, which means that the tangent of theta is also going to increase. So because the tangent of theta increases, that means that theta is also going to increase. Similarly, as delta x increases, well, now that delta x is in the denominator, that means that the whole fraction is going to decrease, meaning that the tangent of theta is also going to decrease, which means that theta is going to decrease. So instead of brute forcing everything, let's see if there is a strategy that lets us uh, either keep delta y the same or decrease it while increasing delta x. So one thing to notice is that if we move or if we reflect the point up or down, 
that can only ever increase our delta y. So it is always going to be suboptimal to increase vertically or to reflect vertically. Similarly, if we wanted to uh, reflect, uh, if we wanted to reflect uh, rightwards, well, that would require that our guy rotate past our point at some point. So it's always going to be suboptimal to reflect towards the right. So what that means is that it's always going to be optimal to uh, reflect leftwards. And not only that, it's always going to be optimal to re reflect as far left as possible because the more we reflect left, the greater our delta x will be. So because of that, that means that our theta will be as low as possible. So the last thing to discuss is how can we compute the points of reflection? So if we have some vertical mirror and we have a point on it, we want to figure out, and let's call this point P. We want to figure out what P prime is such that P prime is the reflection of P about the mirror. To find this, we're going to find the distance between P and the mirror. Let's say the mirror is situated at X equals X of M. That means that the distance from P to the mirror is going to be P of X minus X of M. So we also want point P by the properties of reflection to be equidistant from the mirror. So we also know that this is going to be length D. Therefore, to calculate the new X value of P prime, it's going to be equal to X of M minus D, which D is equal to P of X minus X of M. This is equal to 2x of m minus p of x. And then because we're reflecting about a vertical line, our y value is not going to change at all. So py prime is going to be equal to p of y. Tying this all together, what we're going to do is we're going to reflect our code point k times across the left wall, and then we can construct the right triangle connecting from our point to our reflected point, and compute our angle using the tangent function. Lastly, let's take a look at stronghold triangulation. In this problem, we're given that there's two rays, and we want to find the intersection point between these two rays where for each ray, we're given its x and y coordinates for its initial point. And then we're also given each one's angle, where the angle is measured clockwise from the positive y-axis. So the first thing we need to do with this problem is whenever we work with our trig functions, which we'll need for this problem, we have to convert our angles from degrees to radians, which can be done by multiplying by pi over 180. And then we also have to convert these angles such that they're measured from the positive x axis counterclockwise. To do this, we can negate the angle and this will flip it from uh, clockwise to counterclockwise. And then we can add pi over two to it. So now let's take a look at a related problem. Instead of looking at rays, let's take a look at full lines. And we wanna find what the intersection point of these two lines are given the same information that we're given above, where we're given an initial point and an angle. So the first thing we need to do is we need to find the equation of these two lines. So what we can do is we can use point slope form. So we're going to say that y minus y1 is going to be equal to the slope times x minus x1. 
But what might the slope be? The slope is going to end up being the tangent of our angle. However, one issue with the tangent function is that if our angle is 90 degrees, or uh, it could be pointing either vertically uh, upwards or downwards, the tangent function is going to be undefined. So instead of working with the tangent function, let's substitute it in for the sine of theta 1 divided by the cosine of theta 1. And now what we can do is to avoid dividing by 0 is we can multiply both sides by the cosine of theta. So we would get that the cosine of theta 1 times y minus y1 is going to be equal to the sine of theta 1 times x minus x1. Similarly, for our second line, uh, the line will be equal to cosine of theta 2 times y minus y2 equals sine of theta 2 times x minus x2. So now we have two equations with two unknowns. So we can rearrange these lines using some algebra to get an equation in the form ax plus by is equal to e. And then another equation in the form cx plus dy is equal to f. So what we can do is uh, performing some algebra, we can use uh, elimination to get that x is going to be equal to e times d minus f times b divided by a times d minus c times b. Similarly, we can get that y is going to be equal to a times f minus e times c divided by a times d minus c times b. So what we can do is we can rearrange these equations to get them into standard form and then plug in our coefficients into these two equations. And now that we have our intersection point, we can look back at our original problem. Because the issue is that we don't have full lines, we only have half of lines, i.e. rays. So what we can do is we can draw our two original rays. And let's say we have two rays that don't intersect. Uh, what we can do is we can take a look at their full line, get those intersection points, or get that intersection point. And then now what we can do is we will construct two rays going from each start point to the intersection point. Then to check to see if this is a valid intersection point for our rays, we can check the angles of our new constructed rays. And if those are not equal, that means there is no intersection point. However, if they are equal to both of the original vectors, that means there is an intersection point, and therefore that intersection point is the answer. Hello, I'm Thomas Meeks. I'm on the UCF programming team, and I will be going over the judge editorials for Coin Drop and Denker's Dice, which are both problems that I wrote for HSPT. So the Coin Drop problem is as follows. Uh, once you gloss over the flavor text, it is given the radius of a coin and the side lengths of a square table, determine the probability that when the coin is dropped on the table randomly, such that its center lies on the table, that some portion of the coin will be hanging off the table. This is so that uh, in the story that the coin will be easy to pick up. A very important uh, statement is that the center is guaranteed to lie on the table. This is something important and I'm drawing attention to it because we will use this fact later. So just to give an example, uh, the coin on the left has a portion of it hanging off, which will make it easy for Brian to pick it up. Um, and the coin on the right, being located kind of in the middle of the table, has no portion of it hanging off, therefore it will be hard to pick up. And we want to know if a coin is dropped on the table, what is the chance that it will be in some way like the coin on the left? 
Uh, a key observation is that the circle will always intersect, the circle being the coin, because we are representing the coin as a perfect circle. Uh, the circle will always intersect with the square at the side, not the corner. This is because the distance from the coin's center to the corner is equal to its vertical distance from the side squared plus its horizontal squared and the square root of that. Uh, you might rec recognize this as the common distance formula. Since both the vertical distance and the horizontal distance are going to be equal to r, the radius of the coin, uh, the distance from the corner will always be greater than r. Um, and you can prove that. Another observation is that the coin will intersect with the table edge when it is within r units of the table edge. This combined with the previous observation can be used to create a sort of visual mapping of valid positions for the coin to land such that it will be easy to pick up, which is shown in blue. The red area in the center are center locations that if the coin were to be placed there, um, if the coin center is to be placed within that area, it will not be able to be picked up. Um, so you can see that it is a square with a sort of ring around it of uh, size r. This means that we can turn this into a kind of straightforward formula, in which case we take the area of the table that is given, since we're giving it given its length, um, and we can construct the side length of the bad area, which is the area that the coin will land in uh, such that it cannot be picked up. And since we are guaranteed that the coin's center will land within the table, we know that the coin can be shown as landing anywhere on the table. We can then subtract two times the coin's radius to account for either side uh, and up and down. And now the area of this bad section uh, can be taken by squaring that, since it is a square. Now, that gives us the probability that if the coin is dropped on the table, that it, it will land in the bad area. And now 1 minus that probability will give us the probability that it will land in the good area. Um, and this conceptual switch from finding the probability of success to rather finding the probability of failure and then doing 1 minus that probability is a common trick that sometimes can make problems slightly easier to solve. The math remains mostly the same or sometimes fundamentally different. Um, and so being able to know when to switch this up can sometimes be useful. Uh, and it is in this problem. Um, however, bad news. This gives us the wrong answer. And that's because there is a small edge case in which what happens when the coin is bigger than our table. Uh, from our previous visual representation, that would be equivalent to the bad area square being almost negative area, which doesn't make sense in the problem. Uh, the side length can become negative, um, therefore when you square it, the in, rather than being zero, it becomes a value that doesn't represent the problem anymore. Uh, we can very easily fix this by maxing this equation with zero, um, which will ignore the negative numbers, and now the rest of our math will work fine. Hello, I'm Thomas Meeks. I'm the problem writer for Denka's Dice, and this is the editorial. So the problem statement is that you are given an integer target value and the number of sides of a dice, and you want to determine the probability that Professor Denka will win the game that he is playing. So the way he plays the game is he's going to Start with a total or score of zero, roll the dice, and whatever number that the dice lands on, the dice is labeled 1 through S, S being the number of sides, 
he is going to add that value to his score or his total. If that total is ever equal to a target value that is decided before he starts playing the game, then he will win. Um, and if it's ever over, then by the basics of the game, he loses because he can never go back. If he's uh, And he can roll his dice an arbitrary number of times. As he's still under the score, he can still keep rolling, since you can always roll a 1 and like still have a chance of reaching your target value. And we want to determine for a target value what is the probability that he will win the game. Uh, you might want to say that the probability will be like 1 over s or something like that. And that's actually true, that for very large target values, the probability does actually converge to 1 over s. But it does not do so quickly enough that you can state that that is the probability. So you're going to have to do like a little bit more complicated stuff than that. So what do we know so far? Well, we can say that there is a 100% chance of winning the game with a target value of 0, because his score starts at 0, so he just instantly wins. We also can say with some intuition that the probability of winning the game at a certain target value is going to depend on the probabilities that come before it. Uh, it doesn't quite make sense for it to depend on the values that come after it, so like, we can go with that intuition. So if there's some way for us to combine the previous probabilities, the previous scores, the previous values that can be reached and the chance of reaching those values, right? Because just because a value is not a target, the probability of reaching that value is going to stay the same. So if we can combine the chance of some previous scores, some previous values that can be reached, to find the probability of reaching a new target, that will lead us towards the solution. So, for example, if, so, a, the way that this comes about is that, let's say we have S sides. Well, if we're at the score of zero, our total is now zero, then we have a 100, 100 being 100% 100 chance, 100 over S chance of jumping to the next s values. Each one, you can roll the dice and say you roll a 2, you'll jump to the 2. And you'll have a 1 over s chance of doing that, uh, or 100 over s, because the probabilities are from 0 to 100, chance of doing that. And so the you'll kind of add whatever the chance of reaching your value is the chance of reaching the next s values, you're going to add your value over s to that. Um, and that's like how, how it will work, because when you roll the dice, you kind of jump to those next values. And so if we go forward, now you can say that there's a 33.3333% chance of getting to a 1. And that makes sense, because... You start at 0, when you roll the dice, you have a 1 in 3 chance of rolling a 1, and if you roll a 2, you can't roll a 1 ever, so you're, you're done. And so if we step through this, we end up getting to this probability distribution. Um, and what's interesting about this is that we can actually approach the problem from the opposite perspective. Because what we can instead say now is that the probability of reaching any given target value is actually going to be the average of the last s probabilities um, for the last s target values. So for the target value of 3, it's going to be the average of 100 plus 33.33 plus 44.44444. And you're going to divide that by the number of sides because you're going to take the sum and divide by the number of sides. And so we can say that the probability for reaching any target value is going to be the average for the previous target values. And this lends itself towards a, the conventional like DP style of thinking, dynamic programming, that uh, you might see and you might try to do. Um, and it, it lends itself to a nice recurrence relation that the probability of reaching a target value of n is going to 
be equal to the average of the last s target values. It's going, and then the base cases will be the fact that t of 0, there's a 100% chance, and t of any negative number is a 0% chance. Because if, say, you're at t of 2 and the, si the dice has 50 sides, you can't really take the last 50 values. So you have to assume negative values are going to be 0, which they are because you can't get a negative score. Um, and so this gives us a recurrence relation. And this recurrence relation, you might be able to uh, program like a recursive DP and, and try to do that. The problem is, is that for this version of the problem, S is very large. So any sort of uh, typical recursive DP will end up having T states and an order S transition time, which means our total time complexity will be O of T times S. Since both T and S can be up to 10 to the 6, this could take up to a trillion operations or about 2.5 hours, uh, typically, which will cause TLE and you won't be able to, uh, yeah, cause TLE. So how do we improve this? Well, if we build our probability table up from T of 0 to T of n, then the problem becomes how do we compute T sub i quickly? We need a way of finding the last s values, the sum of them, because we can get the average by always dividing by s, since it will be constant. So if we have a way of computing the last s values, the sum of the last s values, then we've effectively solved our problem. And we can do this with a prefix sums. So if you know what a prefix sum is, it is a nifty trick that allows you to take an array of values and Basically, you're going to make each index in that array actually have the value of the prefix up to that point, the sum of the prefix of values up to that point. So assuming we had all of our values, we could make a prefix sum out of that. But if we had all of, that, all of our values, then we would already have the answer. So we actually have to build our prefix sum and use our prefix sum as we're building it. Now, you can't normally do updates on prefix sum quickly. Uh, it takes order n because you have to update all values after it. But if we, in the process of building the prefix sum, manipulate it, then we can take advantage of the prefix sum's characteristics. So what we can do is compute t sub i by actually using the prefix sum to compute the average, where we will take ps of i minus 1 minus ps of i minus the number of sides minus 1, which will give us the, the sum up to that point, and we'll divide that by s. And then we can say that ps of i is actually equal to t of i plus ps of i minus 1. Uh, and so we'll compute up with a prefix sum. Um, there are a few more details to this. Uh, we can store a separate dp array, and then also have a uh, prefix sum array. Um, or we can do, do it in one array, one prefix sum array. And then when we're, whenever we have to actually output, we can output ps of our target value that we're querying minus ps of t minus 1, because that's how you get one element of a prefix sum array. Um, you want to, when you're doing this, make sure to avoid accessing negative indices. There's a couple ways to do that which will be up to implementation details, but it is something that you have to keep track of. This problem also has uh, many queries, so, but they all have the same number of sides. So what you actually end up wanting to do is compute this prefix sum, or this, this DP array one time um, up to max value, since the max target can only be up to 10 to the 6, which you can do one pass. And then whenever you're going through your multiple queries, you can answer each query um, pretty much instantly by accessing a value of that array. You don't want to recompute for each query because you don't need to, and also because since there can be many queries, that would cause you to TLE. Um, there are also some alternate methods to solve this. Um, one of the judge solutions actually uses a sliding window technique where you update your average as you go along, subtracting and then adding. Uh, you could also use the previous um, 
slides uh, shows that you can actually do like a range update segment tree where instead of taking the average of your past values you will update your future values. Um, segment tree is not required and would be kind of overkill for this problem but it is a very valid solution um, with an extra log factor but it would it would pass in most languages. Um, there's also you can do a recursive solution, but the recursive solution that was found by the team um, kind of simulates the prefix sum, so it doesn't actually end up being much different than the iterative solution. This problem is was not uh, perfectly meant to be solved recursively, and so if you ha were very strong with recursive uh, dynamic programming but have not done much iterative dynamic programming, this might have been a more difficult problem, um, which in part was intended. Um, it, it lends itself to iterative, program, iterative dynamic programming, which a lot of problems do, and so having the uh, strength of being able to do iterative dynamic programming is something that can be taken advantage of in a lot of problems, and a lot of optimizations can be used, such as these prefix sum optimizations or segment tree optimizations, and so it's very useful to have. Um, and that's all for this Hello. problem. I'm Sachin Sivakumar, one of the HSPT judges. I'll be covering the solution to ultimate hardcore mindset, also known as UHC. I did not create this problem, but I think it's pretty interesting. UHC is the last problem on the set because we saved the best for last. The gist of the problem is this. Steve wants to beat Minecraft at its absolute hardest. He's on a hardcore difficulty, and loses all of his progress when he dies. But that wasn't hard enough for Steve. He has a series of risky shortcuts that he absolutely wants to take before beating the game. This can include things like cave mining with no armor, fighting three blazes at once, and doing the MLG water bucket trick. The problem reduces to, given a series of tasks with durations and probabilities of success, what is the expected time it will take Steve to complete every task in a row without failing? For example, if Steve has three tasks, and he passes tasks 1 and 2 but fails task 3, he must start over from task 1. The problem statement also says that if Steve fails the task, it still takes him the entire duration to attempt the task. I'll go over an example just to help you understand. For example, if in the cave mining task he has a 20% probability of success and it takes 45 seconds, the fighting three blazes has a 50% chance of success and it takes 30 seconds, and the MLG water bucket trick has a 3% chance of success and takes 6 seconds. If Steve gets lucky and he passes the cave mining task, he has spent 45 seconds so far on his tasks and if he manages to also defeat all the blazes with the 50% chance of success, then he has spent 30 more seconds for a total of 75 seconds so far. But if he manages, if he still fails on the MLG water bucket trick, which is very likely, he will have spent the 6 seconds. So, so far on his run, he has spent 81 seconds, and he has to start over from the beginning. So the problem is finding what the expected amount of time it, it will be for Steve to finish everything in a row. So how do we solve this problem? There are many different ways to solve it, but I'm going to cover the one that I feel is the most intuitive. So how would I approach this problem? If a problem seems too complex, try to break it into subproblems. The subproblem we're going to focus on for this problem is what if Steve doesn't lose all of his progress after failing a task? You should make some key observations about this problem. Something important that wasn't there in the previous problem but is in the subproblem is that the time taken to complete each task is independent from that of the other tasks. What this means is that we can calculate the expected time taken to complete each task separately and add them together. We need to calculate the expected time for a single task. Let E of I be the expected time to complete task I. Intuitively, we can say that 
the time taken to attempt a task multiplied by the expected number of attempts is how we get the expected time to complete a task. Now we've reduced the problem even further. How do we find the expected number of attempts to pass task I? Some of you might have taken statistics and they might have gone over this formula in that class. But the expected number of attempts to pass a, pass a task with a probability of success is 1 divided by that probability of success. What this says is that the lower that your probability of success is, the more number of attempts it will take to succeed. For example, if your probability of success is 20%, it will take an average of 5 attempts to succeed. Take some time to convince yourself that this is true. And if you really aren't convinced or want to figure out why this is true, look up the geometric distribution. This formula is the formula for the mean of the geometric distribution. So using these past two formulas, we can create a third formula, which is the answer for E of I. And that is E of I equals T of I divided by P of I. So the expected time for a single task is the time taken for that task divided by the probability of succeeding at that task. And going back to answering the whole subproblem, the final answer is the sum of E of I over all tasks. So, how does the original problem differ from the subproblem? We restart from the first task after each failure. The key difference is that since we have to restart, each task isn't independent from the previous tasks. But can we use this to our advantage? I'm going to make a series of steps in getting towards the solution. And if you feel like you, at any point you have an idea of where this is going, please pause the video and try to work it out yourself. So now we're going to redefine E1 of I to be the expected time to finish tasks 1 to I in a row. We can still use the previous definition of E to find E1 of 1 because there are no previous tasks if you're starting at task 1. So you can use the previous formula. What about for later tasks? To even attempt task 2, we have to clear task 1. So it's like for every attempt of task 2, not only do we have to spend time doing task 2, but we have to spend time getting through task 1. Well, how long does it usually take to get through task 1? We actually just calculated this, and it's on screen. E1 of 1 is T1 divided by P1. So we can use this in our formula. If we let big T of I be the adjusted time taken to attempt task I when factoring in time to do previous tasks in a row, then the formula for T2 of is a lowercase t2 plus E1 of 1. And this is saying that the time is, you factor in the time to do the second task and the expected time to do the first task. This idea extends to every task. To attempt any task, we have to spend time on the task and getting through all the tasks before it. So we get a recursive definition where we get uh, uppercase T of I equals lowercase T of I plus E1 of I minus 1. Now we're getting somewhere. We have the adjusted time taken to attempt task I, which includes completing all previous tasks in a row. What is the expected time to complete task I and extend the streak? It's the same idea as earlier. If we completed all previous I minus 1 tasks in a row, then the probability of completing the first I tasks in a row only depends on the probability of passing the I task, which is the last one in a row. And we have a time taken to attempt a task and the probability of success now. So given these two facts, we can use put them together in a formula, which is E1 of I equals T of I plus E1 of I minus 1, all of that divided by P of I. And also given the fact that E1 
of 1 is t1 divided by p1, we can now compute the answer, which is e1 of n. We can do this either recursively or using a loop. And this nice formula allows us to write elegant code. Now, how would you implement this? There is a solution. I asked ChatGPT to explain the concept of code golfing. And it said that code golfing is a programming challenge where the goal is to solve a problem using the fewest number of characters possible. And some of the people on the programming team at UCF have done exactly that with a two-line solution in Python. And that's food for thought. This is not a very good way to code things, but you can really express your creativity and try to find even better ways to optimize the solution. And I hope that you enjoyed this video, and I hope to see you guys at the next HSBT.